to our worship service today. You all look so happy and so beautiful seated out here before me, and I know that God is going to move in a mighty way as we worship today at the Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our call to worship today, I invite you to read this with me. Why don't we just uh, stand together as we read on the screen. The text in Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is great God, the great King above all gods. Be seated.
I invite you to stand for the invocation. Oh, gracious God, we thank you today for your power that has called us from wherever we are into your house of worship and praise today. We invite you to tabernacle with us in a mighty way. Commission those same angels who hung around the cross to abide with us here today and be in our worship. And may we, after we leave this place, declare surely we have been with Jesus and it has been good to have been here. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to sing with us, remain standing, and let's sing this opening song for the beauty of the earth, hymn number 565.
Thank you, boys and girls. We'd like to ask the rest of the boys and girls, you can start coming up for the children's story. Our church life is very brief. So boys and girls, you can come up for the children's story. Briefly in your announcements, in, uh, two quick announcements. One uh, for next week for young adults. There is a luncheon. Take note of that, and you're invited next Sabbath. And we're having a short three-week series for Koinonia for both the kids and the parents beginning this Wednesday evening. Take note of that special announcement, how to be a witness. You'll find it very important. One quick announcement. Uh, we want to extend our condolences to uh, Dean Neff, who has lost her brother this week, and keep her in your prayers. Also, one brief item. We have five individuals transferring out. We would take a motion that we accept these transfers. So moved. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Thank you very much. Boys and girls, you can have the children's story. Hope so. Here we go. Good morning, boys and girls. I have a story for you. It's a story about three stone masons. And I think what I'll do to tell the story is I'll just interview them. Good morning, Adam. Can I ask you a question? What are you doing? Well, can't you see? I'm a stone mason. I'm hitting the rocks. I'm trying to make these stones good. Do you like your do you like your job? Not really. I can hardly wait to go home at five o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Well, good morning, Basel. Basel, can I talk to you? Sure. What are you doing? Well, well, I am working very carefully to build a wall. Yep. It's an okay job. Yeah, you like it? Uh, it, it helps me buy food for my children. Thank you. Okay, now let's go to Charles. Let's ask Charles. Charles, what are you doing? In building a cathedral. Someday this wall is going to become the wall of a cathedral and people are going to come to this cathedral and they're going to worship God. Do you like your job? Oh, there's nothing better I could do. So boys and girls, three stone masons and they were very different, and they thought very differently about their work, didn't they? There was one who couldn't really enjoy his work. Another one who's like, well, it's okay, I'm building a wall. And then there was Charles, who loved what he did, and he worked very carefully to do everything as perfectly as he could because he was so in love with Jesus, he wanted to build this cathedral that would glorify God. So, which stonemason can you relate to? Which one do you think you would like to work like? Um, the one that was making the cathedral. Yeah, me too. Me too. There's a verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes 9.10 that really super wise man named Solomon wrote. He said, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And what he's saying is whatever your work is, 
Do it with 100%. Do it because you love God, like Charles. But you might say, I don't have a job. I'm not a stonemason. I'm not even a nurse. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a policeman or a fireman. I don't have a job. But boys and girls, you do. You have a calling. You have work. You have things that God calls you to do. What are some of those things that you are supposed to do? Spread God's word. Help God. Yeah. In what kinds of ways? Do you do it when you're at school? Do you think your work is going to school? By helping people. Yeah. And like your moms and dads doing chores? By doing at the kindnesses. Yeah. All those things are your work, but I would argue that even going to school and studying and doing those yucky chores for mom and dad, if you can do those because you love God and because that work is sacred, it's holy, then you will be much happier and healthier too, I suggest. Okay? So what we do and the way our attitude is on the inside, the way we can see everything is sacred and a way to glorify God and to experience God's love and say lovingly thank you back to God really can affect the way we live. Okay. Thanks, boys and girls. I understand there is Children's Church, so now you can walk quietly to Children's Church. Thank you.
At this time, I would like to have the deacons come forward to collect their offering. And today's offering is for the um, Conference of Regional Ministries, and also for the loose uh, offering is for the church budget. Uh, and Matthew 24:14 says, "In this gospel, 
of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all of the nations, and then the end will come. When we return our honest tithe, give our generous offering and gifts to the Lord and to help the poor, we do so in the acknowledgement of God's ownership of all things. In so doing, we also support the proclamation of his gospel before the time of crisis and render faithful service to our fellow human beings. As we return God's tithe and give our free will offering today, let us remember that the words of Ellen G. White in the early writings, where she says, houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble. And at that time, the procession cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of the present truth. So I appeal to you that may we not be found of the, of the positions that the last and before the Jesus had come. And they can just collect the offering, please. Thank you, Lord, for entrusting us with your resources. Help us be faithful in using them for your glory and for the building up of your kingdom. Amen.
It's time for prayer, and those of you that have any uh, special requests, please come forward at this time. I would like to also mention that there are many people across the world that are suffering. There are earthquakes, there are hurricanes, there are fire in Northern California, and it's not in the news anymore because it's yesterday's news, it's actually last month. But talking to the folks in the Caribbean, they are still suffering. So let us remember them in our daily praise. So those who uh, have special needs, special prayers, special thanksgiving, please come forward. The rest of you in the pews, will you please kneel as we pray? Father God, we thank you that you so loved us, that Jesus loved us, and the Spirit loved us, that Jesus came and died on a cross for our sins. We accept the grace that you have extended to us, and we thank you for the daily breath of life that we breathe each and every day, each and every minute. We thank you for all the blessings the blessing of church fellowship with each and other members. God, we would like to ask that you'll be with those of our members and those of the extended family in the hospital that are sick. You know each need of each person that is ill, be with them, be their comforter. We also ask that you'll be with the families of those individuals who may be at this time ill or suffering from some distressing situation. Because when an individual is sick, the whole family is suffering along. We want also to ask your mercies on the many people throughout the world who are suffering from disaster, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's flooding, whether it's fires, whether it's earthquake. We know that some of your people are worshiping in outdoors churches today because their churches have been destroyed. Be with them also. Be with those that came forward with special requests. Let us pause and listen to their requests as they extend them to you. And finally, God, we thank you that we have Pastor Baptiste to preach to us today. 
continue to give him your words so that we may listen and understand that through his preaching we can better serve you. We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. morning and happy sabbath our scripture reading this morning is taken from luke 7 36 through 50 which will be on the screen as well and it is taken from the new international version when one of the pharisees invited jesus to have dinner with him he went to the pharisee's house and reclined at the table a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed, them, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell her, I tell you that her sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests said to the, began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then Jesus said to the women, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In this holiday season, well, it's really not a holiday, but it's a Halloween season when everybody's celebrating, getting ready to celebrate Halloween, and they're looking at the costumes that they're going to wear and change into. I invite you to explore with me the subject from this passage I've entitled, Changed, Changed. Everybody just say changed real quick, changed. Changed. Turn to your neighbor next to you and just tell him, tell him, I've been changed. I've been changed. Now, 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 turn to your other neighbor and t tell him, he can change you too. Oh, yes, he can. As people of faith, have you ever wished you could change society around you? Have you ever wondered, how can we change the world? If anybody wants evidence that a child of God can impact a secular society and change the world, change the country, change the city, change the room, look right here in this story. This woman demonstrates change made possible by Jesus Christ. He changed her heart and he changed her daily walk and her talk and she changed the room. But how did she do it? 
Here, Simon the Pharisee invites Jesus to dinner. In fact, he invited all the other guests to accept this woman. See the doctors and the lawyers and the teachers and the scribes and the scholars and the priests and the Pharisees and the philosophers all gathered together to a meal with Jesus. Everybody's name written on the guest list reclined forward in the formal ancient Jewish eating custom except this woman. They did not invite her. The Bible says she was a sinner. And when Bible writers use that expression to refer to a woman, it usually means she was a prostitute. You see, they did not invite her to the meal, but still she showed up anyway. Can you see her today? A prostitute among the Pharisees and priests, a poor woman among rich men, the powerless one among the powerful ones, the uneducated among the educated, the outcast among the accepted, the shunned among the embraced, the refused among the received, the admitted sinner among the self-righteous, the weak among the strong, a woman of shame among men of pride. But with her name not on the guest list, how dare she enter and touch Jesus' feet? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. You see, this uninvited guest sneaks into the room to be with Jesus. Look at it again. In this story, she sneaks past the front door and into the dining room of the house just to be with Jesus. She wasn't accustomed to going to no Pharisee's house, and she didn't belong there, but she went to be with Jesus. Oh, I just stopped by to tell somebody today that, my dear Christian friends, it's okay no matter where you go. You can be okay. You'll be fine as long as you're with Jesus. The songwriter said it this way, anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear, I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. And in this story, she had the nerve to show up with a sinner's bad reputation, unannounced, unexpected, and uninvited in a Pharisee's house. She knew they would not welcome or accept her there, but you know, with Jesus there, she had safety and security. Can you see her there, kneeling at the feet of Jesus? My dear Christian friends, there's no better place for a sinner to be than kneeling at the feet of Jesus. Look at this woman humbly kneeling, working, and silently weeping at his feet. She has no other purpose or reason for being there. Nobody else wants her there, and nobody else needs her there. This woman ain't nobody in a world of religious somebodies, but she showed up just because she loved Jesus. Have you ever gone somewhere just to be with the one you loved? Not worrying about nobody else, but the one you loved. Remember how you felt like a simple, annoying tag along, but they didn't know you came just to be with the one you loved. This woman shows up simply for the one she loves. No secondary plans, no hidden agendas, no, 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 none of that here. None of that in this passage, only a burning desire to be with Jesus. And even today in our world, millions of insignificant, poor, rejected, and outcast people enter his presence daily. Daily, they tiptoe silently, secretly, and unannounced into the room through prayer and Bible study just to be with Jesus. And while some sit gossiping, pushing, and shoving, they have positioned themselves at his feet with a humble spirit, the silence of weeping tears, and a heart willing to do service. Don't make fun of the poor. Uh, don't laugh at the outcast. Don't you mock the, the reject. Don't scorn the prostitute or ridicule the the weak for any of them may be at the feet of Jesus 
He bids us come boldly to the throne of grace where we could obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And he says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But he invites us not just into his presence to experience change, but to serve and work and cause change in the world. She came into his presence to serve and bless him. He had already forgiven her, healed her, and renewed her life. According to the text, she came because she had been changed. Now she just came to serve him, show her love, and say thank you. The story says she washed our Lord's feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And the obvious question I know somebody must be asking, is oh but brother preacher if she's been so changed by god then why is she weeping oh i just love your type of questions somebody says maybe she cried because of fear but no she entered a pharisee's house uninvited no fear there somebody else says well maybe she cried because of pain and agony but no she's crouched at his feet free of physical pain uh, somebody else still posits maybe she she cries because of shame but she let her hair down to wipe his feet and in this society respectable women never let their hair down so she has no shame i think she cried because jesus changed her heart get this picture for a moment a bold fearless mobile unashamed woman with her hair down at Jesus's feet weeping without caring what anybody thinks of her in other words a woman who never went to church now cries and weeps by the feet of Christ the head of the church a woman who laughed at God now weeps in the presence of the Son of God a woman who others considered the filth of the street now washes the holy feet of Christ made filthy by the street. A woman who made love without her heart's involvement now loving the Lord with all her heart. A woman who loved none but pleasured all now finds pleasure in loving the one who first loved her. Jesus dramatically changed her life. What does Jesus say? The one who is forgiven much loves much like all of us jesus forgave her much and now she loved much before this she had a corrupted view of love and money but now she freely gave her love to jesus the savior without money and tears of joy well up in her eyes because her heart was changed. Somebody just turn to your neighbor and tell him again, changed. Just go on, turn to your neighbor, just tell him, changed, changed. That's right, Jesus changed her heart. She wouldn't cry like this before because her heart was different. How did Jesus change her heart, you ask? Oh, I don't know how he did it, but didn't he say in Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I don't quite know just how he does it, but I know he promises to do it. And these tears form the evidence that he can do what he says he will do this morning. He changed her heart and now with a changed heart, she serves Jesus. changed her and Christian friends he can change you too right here in this room the Holy Spirit can move you into the operating room of glory he can take out your old heart he can give you a new heart I almost said go on and touch somebody and tell them Jesus can change you but y'all might not want to do that. So, oh yes, he can change you. Jesus can change anybody who comes to him. Jesus offers the only real change, the only genuine change for this world today. I called the president to offer Jesus as America's source of change, you know. He's trying to 
do what he can to make America great again. But he wouldn't take my call, so I just thought I'd stop by here this morning and offer you Jesus as your change source. He can change anybody, transform any church. He can fix any situation. He still works in the new heart, life-changing business today. Oh, he's a mind regulator and a temperature cooler. He's a blood pressure adjuster and a muscle relaxer. He's a body builder and a soul transformer and a spirit healer and a sin forgiver and a question answerer and a problem solver. He's a heart changer and a joy giver and a depression lifter and a hope elevator and a tear dryer. By his precious blood and sacrificial life, he changes lives today. Don't you want that change, that transformation, that new life? Well, 2,000 years ago, the devil said to Jesus, they're all mine, all of humanity, every man, woman, boy, and girl now belongs to me. But Jesus responded, over my dead body. And he shed his blood and gave his life for you and for me. Oh, my dear Christian friends, this is the gospel. And I want to be so full of Christ Jesus that even if a mosquito bites me, it flies away singing power in the blood, power in the blood, power in the blood of the Lamb. See, he not only changes you, but he saves you by his death. But then I looked and saw this woman kissing Jesus' feet. And I suddenly heard Simon the Pharisee speaking from the text, from the text, from the text. You know, every dinner luncheon with Jesus always has a Simon in the room. In case there's a Simon here at church this morning, I haven't met one since I've been here, but if, if in case there's a Simon, I just want you to know I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the Simon that's in the text, amen? He said, if this Jesus was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was, that she was a sinner touching him. You know, our Jewish law forbids contact with anyone or anything that's unclean, but this Jesus lets sinners touch him. See, I didn't hear uh, their talk before she entered the room, but I heard what Simon the Pharisee said after she entered the room. And according to Simon, this woman changed the conversation in the room with a with a, with a heart change she now served and she changed the conversation in the room i do declare that whenever you serve jesus you too can change the conversation anybody so transformed by christ's love can impact society and that's all i came to say to you this day this woman changed by jesus changed the conversation by her service god's love can change anybody so you can be his his eyes, his hands, his feet in the world to change a dark society and a broken planet. No matter how messed up you may be, be Christ Jesus can change you and anybody Christ changes can change the conversation. She did what the powerless in our society don't usually do. You can't just walk into the room and change the talk of dignitaries and royalty and businessmen and power brokers and lawyers and teachers and sophisticated folk. Oh, but she did it. She changed the conversation. And look at what she changed it to. We don't know what they were talking about before she entered, but now in verse 39, they talked about how Jesus lets sinners touch him. Hmm. Don't y'all just love that kind of conversation? The amazing story of how the God of the universe, pure, holy, and undefiled, allows dirty sinners like you and me to touch him. And I don't know about you, but that's all I want to do today is touch him. I know somebody wants to reach out and touch the law today. It's still true, my friends. He lets sinners touch him and each time you touch him and serve him it happens again you can change the conversation in the room but how can you touch Jesus without his, his physical presence Matthew 25 40 records that Jesus will say in as much as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and my sisters you did it to me 
you can reach up and touch him by serving others here below. So how can we change the world? Just touch Jesus by serving others. And every time you do that, you'll change the conversation in the room. And scribes and Pharisees are still baffled today over the behavior of Jesus. But what gives me glory this day is that 2,000 years ago, the creator of heaven and earth and this entire universe and the maker of mankind got up off his throne in glory, threw off his royal robe. He stepped down through 40 and two generations all the way down to this earth from glory, locked himself away in Mary's belly for nine months where he picked up enough flesh and blood for you and I to touch him. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He's alive in every accepting heart and he still changes lives and lets sinners touch him today. And when you touch him, you can change the conversation in the room, in your family, in your life, in your community, in the city, in your school, in your workplace, everywhere you can change the conversation. But Dr. Luke says she not only washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, but she anointed them with oil from her alabaster box. And while Simon and his friends fussed over this woman's actions, they missed the aromatic smell of her sweet perfume. You see, by serving Jesus, she not only changed the conversation, but by serving Jesus, she changed the room itself. And I don't know what it smelled like before, but now it smelled good. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. Anybody changed by God's love has a mighty power to change the world around them through service. This world still asks that million dollar question of verse 49 who is this who even forgives sins what is our final answer his name is Jesus he's alive and working in the world today living with him changes your life working with him changes the world oh does somebody want to serve Jesus today does somebody want to work for Jesus today if Jesus has forgiven you of much and change your life I invite you just stand with me and sing this song of commitment and service for him <clears throat> Indeed, you've changed us and given us a mighty power, enabling us to change the world around us. 
anytime we serve you. Bless us now. May we indeed use that power to change the world. Amen. Remain standing as we sing our closing song today. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. May the Lord smile merciful upon thee and give thee peace in your rising up and in your setting down, in your going out and in your coming in, in your laughter and in your sorrow, in your labor and in your leisure until you come to the place where there's no more sunset and no dawning. Amen. Be seated.